Um, obviously, you can see that I am carrying a cane this morning, or using a cane this morning. I, uh, I need <laughs> that cane this morning. I wish I could tell you I had an elaborate story to share with you as to why I'm using this cane, but I do not have an elaborate story. Last night, I was, we had guests over, and after they left, and we put the kids down, and Chris and I were sitting on the couch, and then it was bedtime, and I stood up. Period. <laughs> I have no idea what happened to my toe at that point, other than it hurt, and I thought, okay, well, I, I, I hurt my toe. So I go to bed about 1.30 in the morning or so, I wake up. And I need to go to the restroom because that's what I do. And, uh, and I almost couldn't make it to the bathroom. I was almost having to crawl to the bathroom uh, to such an extent that I actually woke Christy. And I was like, Christy, do I need to go to the emergency room? We both decided I didn't just to kind of bear it out. But uh, I am not capable of really walking without it. it, it uh, I even drove my car to work today. So I... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I got a long commute. <laughs> so I told Craig, I said, Craig, if we, if we leave the pulpit up here, there's no way if I sit, sit on this side, no one over here is going to be able to see me. If I sit on this side, no one over here is going to see me. I said, so move the pulpit off, bring the, st the, the stand up, and let me sit while we do this uh, thing we call Easter service this morning. So I needed a cane this morning, but you all know there's something I needed even more than a cane this morning. I needed Jesus this morning. And you can see in your sermon title this morning, the question I'm asking you is, do you need Jesus? You know, I realize it's Easter morning, and, and on a day like this, it, it brings in the crowds. Every church in the country is, is jam-packed, fuller than normal. And the question we have is, do we need Jesus? Do you actually need Jesus? Does Jesus actually have an impact in your life in 2017? Because just as I need this cane today to walk around, like I said, I need Jesus even more. And I'm going to take us through a, a journey here this morning, beginning in Ephesians chapter 5, in which I hope that we are able to investigate why we need this Jesus who he is, what do we need uh, from him, and so forth, um, and, and everything. There are actually for some seats right over here. If you all are looking for some places to sit, there's some seats right over this area. If, uh, if you all could slide over, yeah, right there, Diana's got her hands up. Diana, raise your hand one more time for me. There's some, there's some up here, some right there. Please come on in and have a seat. No reason to, to stand. Come on in. Um, but we're going to investigate this need for Jesus down in here in Ephesians chapter 5. So let's look at the actual verses. Ephesians chapter 5, I want us to look at just two verses this morning. And that's verse 1 and 2. Paul writing to the church of Ephesus says these words. He says, therefore be imitators of God. As beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for just a moment this morning. Father, it, uh, it is a day where we stop. It is a day where we ponder the relationship of, that we have with you. It is a day that we acknowledge that you are indeed the Savior of the world. It is a day that we humble ourselves before you. And Father, there can be various reasons why we might have come this day, but what we do know is we are here. And you have divinely orchestrated and ordained the events of this world because you are a sovereign God. And there's not a single person here this morning that is here by accident. And so, Father, we are asking that as a result of you drawing on the hearts of men and women and boys and girls and drawing on people to bring them to such a place as this, for such a time as this, we ask that you would meet with us. 
We ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, even this morning. That as we break open this bread of life, as we um, look at some characteristics regarding your Son, Jesus, that we would be changed, that we would draw deeper into a relationship with Him. Father, there is a, a beginning point of the relationship, but just like every relationship, we must grow deeper in it. For those of us who have married or, or even have dated, Father, there's been that courting relationship, a starting point, a place of nervousness, a, a place of uncertainty. And yet, as we progressed in that journey, the more we got to know them, the more we enjoyed the time we spent with them, and the more nuances we learned and discovered about them. And it is the same with you. And so, Father, may we start here this day, even though we are looking at some attributes and some, some truths that are, are starting point and starting block points, may it drive us deeper to seek you, and to know you. So minister to us, Father. Truly let your spirit open our hearts to be receptive to what you have to say. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're taking notes in your listening guide this morning, it's three simple words. They're simplistic and they're not new. They are words that you have heard many times. There, there are words that you may have, if you've even listened to any sermons this particular week on the radio, you may have heard different preachers say these words, because this has been the week of passion, and so most of the radio broadcasts, most of the sermons uh, have even used these words, and yet they are words that are profound for us, because they help us to understand this relationship with Jesus. Because do we need Jesus? Do we even need him? That's the question we're asking. And so the first point that I need you to understand this morning is that Jesus is the Savior. So your point is Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And, and here in this particular passage, you, you come across this, this phrase in, in, in verse 2 that, that says it this way. It says that there's these imitators of God is, and beloved children, what are they going to do is they're going to walk in love just as Christ. Christ also loved you. And you'll notice that word in that little phrase that popped up on that screen, just as Christ. You know, that term, Christ, is not his last name. It is not the last name of Jesus. It is a title. As we would say, President of the United States, it is a title. As we would say, the King of England or the Queen of England, it is a title. Or, or we would say, Prince or Boss, Employer. These are titles, Vice President, President. These are titles, and that is what Christ is. And the particular meaning behind the word Christ is that of the Anointed. That's literally what the Bible is pointing to when it says and uses this phrase, just as Christ also loved you. Christ is the anointed one. God, before the foundations of the world, knew that humanity was going to sin. He knew that you and I were going to sin. He knew Adam and Eve, if you would, would eat from the tree in the garden. And would be in a desperate need for a savior. And, and he knew that humanity by its own nature would strive to meet that need all on their own. And we have. All you have to do is look around at the world and see literally countless numbers of faiths and religions that exist. We, we see a, a movement even towards uh, humanism. And the desire to say that man can be all and can accomplish all. And that he, would, that he is a, has a way and a capacity within him to, to rise up and overcome who he is. And in some of our faiths we even say, oh, 
we, we get the chance to come back and do it again and again until we get it right. Wow. But none of these ideas, none of these concepts, none of these, these other faiths and, and belief systems can ever address the trueness of a need for a Savior. See, the Scriptures absolutely are abundantly clear that, that no one can come to the Father except by the Son. The Scriptures are absolutely and abundantly clear that it is the Father who draws on the hearts of humanity to bring them into this relationship. And so as a result, every one of us, when we were born into this world, we were going to choose to walk into sin. It's what we were going to do. We've used this illustration here on numerous occasions, but we do not have to teach our children how to sin. They do it on their own. It's a natural byproduct. You can, you can look at a child before they can even speak, and you can see the wheels turning in their mind as they choose rebellion. And I've said so many times to you all, the sooner you look at them and realize these are little demons needing saved and not little angels to prance around, the sooner off you're going to be in terms of betterment, in terms of how you raise your kids. Yes, they're adorable. They're lovely looking creatures when they're asleep. When they're asleep. <laughs> but they are in need of a Savior. All of us are. And so Christ comes in this form of this title, this anointed one. Because in our absolute best, the scripture says it is nothing more than filthy rags. I want you to understand that on your absolute best day, on the day that you think you've got it all together, that you're not missing a mark, that you're actually firing on all cylinders, on that day, in comparison to the perfection and righteousness that God requires for one to enter into his presence, it is nothing more than garbage and filth. Because your life and my life has been tainted by sin. It's who we are. It's what we exist in. And so we need this Savior. And so God, knowing this from the foundations of the earth, sends this Savior. says, I will make a way. And in the fullness of time, he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And he did live with us. And he did make claims about himself. He did say that he was the Savior. He did say that he was God in flesh and the Son of God. He said these things about himself. And as a result of saying these words... He was letting us know we needed him. But he didn't just say the words. He then acted upon it. He did act upon it. And that's where we move into our next point, if you will. Not only do we see this, this title, this Christ, this Savior, this anointed one, the one chosen by God, to make us enter into a relationship with him, or I should say, at least provide the pathway for us to enter into a relationship with him. But he also did some other things as well. And that's where we move into our second point. So we see Jesus as our Savior and our need for him because of our sinfulness, but we also see him as our substitute. We see him as our substitute. Again, just continue reading along there in verse 2. So we, we've seen that we walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. Do, do you catch that part? He gave himself up for us. And this is what we mean by a substitute. To understand the fullness of this term, of Jesus sitting here saying to us, that he gave himself up for us, we actually need to go back to the Old Testament. We, we need to go back to Leviticus chapter 16 because in Leviticus chapter 16, we are told the story, or not the story, but the history of what God required at the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is the Old Testament picture of what Jesus Christ himself is. And on the Day of Atonement, it was the one day in Jewish history in which the high priest could enter into 
the Holy of Holies. It's the only day he could do it. Outside of that singular day, no one was permitted into the Holy of Holies. R rabbinic tradition tells us that those, those bells that you read about in the scriptures, those, those bells that are there between the pomegranates that are around his robe, that those bells were there so that as he walked, they would jingle. So that those in the holy place, the, the priest there, would know that he was still moving. Rabbinic tradition tells us that they would actually, as, as time went on, actually tied a rope to the priest. So that if the bells stopped ringing, they could drag him out. Because they knew he would have died in the presence of a holy God. That's what rabbinic tradition tells us. And they could only go in, and it had to be the high priest, the one who represented Israel before God as their mediator. And on that particular day, this priest had to do some things to just prepare himself to go into this holy place, this holy of holies. He had to take a bull, for example, and he would sacrifice this bull for his own sins. And then, after he took that bull for his own sins, he would then take a ram and offer it up as a burnt offering. Now, you need to understand that, that burnt offerings, normally an offering that was presented, a portion of it would be pulled off and given to the priestly class so they could have food as the dues of the people. But a burnt offering? A burnt offering was unique. A burnt offering was different. Because a burnt offering was literally every bit of it given to the Lord God and had to be completely and utterly consumed by God. For God. It was His. God considered it a pleasing aroma to His, to his nostrils, to His smell. And so this priest would offer the bull for his sins, and then he would go into worship. Because that's what that offering really was. It was the priest preparing himself for the worship of the people. Or of, of the Lord God, I apologize, that's not because he wasn't worshiping the people. He was worshiping God. And that's what he was doing. And, it, and, you know, when we say that, it makes us even have to pause ourselves and ask the question. When we come into a place of worship, when we come in, like on a Sunday like this or an Easter service, this once a year routine, if you will, how did you come into this room? Did you come in with a, with a heart of confession? Did you come in with a heart of repentance? Did you come in with a spirit of worship? Because it was so serious that if the high priest did not do that, and he entered into the Holy of Holies, it could cost him his life. Do we have, have an, uh, an authentic, holy reverence for the majesty and glory of the Lord God? And that is what this is referencing here when I describe this portion. But he didn't just do this portion on the Day of Atonement. He would also take two goats two goats, and he would bring them and put them before the tent of meeting. And the tent of meeting is where you had the holy place and then the holy of holies inside of it. And he would bring these two goats before the holy place, the tent of meeting, and he would cast lots. And one of those lots would fall on one goat, and it would be known as the scapegoat. The scapegoat. And after he did some sacrifice, what the priest would do is he would come and he would put his hands literally on the scapegoat and he would pray the sins of Israel onto the goat. And then another individual would take this goat out into the wilderness and let it go to die in the wilderness and it would be away from the camp it was outside of the camp and the sin 
was basically being visualized as being placed on this substitute animal. And beloved, that is exactly what Jesus Christ did. When he came here and gave himself up for us, he literally was taken by the Romans outside of the city of Jerusalem. You just heard Paul mention just a moment ago that he has just come back just from a few weeks ago from Israel. And while there and seeing the empty tomb, I'm also fairly confident you probably went to the place where they believe is the skull, where the uh, crucifixion actually occurred. And it is outside of the city. And that is what Jesus is being represented of doing. Having the sins of the world placed on him. Just as the sins that the priest prayed were placed on the goat and taken out of the city. Jesus is now outside of the city on that Good Friday and the sins of the world are now upon him. And so he is your substitute. So not only is he your savior because of your sinful condition, but he is also your substitute by taking your sin upon himself. But it was not enough just to have a substitute take the sin. There was a third aspect that was absolutely required for this removal of sin. And that is the third point this morning, and that is a sacrifice. A sacrifice had to be made. And, and so, again, continuing on in our, in our text, we, we see this, this, and he walked in love just as Christ also loved you, and he gave himself up for us. And then this phrase, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Paul's audience understood this Old Testament imagery that we've been describing. And what you need to understand is, as I mentioned just a moment ago, there were these two goats. And that first goat, actually, or the one goat that we've already described, was the scapegoat, but the other goat was actually the sacrifice. This second goat would have been killed. And its blood would have been then taken into the Holy of Holies by the high priest. And the high priest would have then entered into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant of God resided. And it's the, if you've seen the movies, The Raider of the Lost Ark, it would be that, that thing that Indiana Jones and the Nazis are trying to find. And uh, it's, that, it's, it's gold, it has a top on it, and, and it's, it's inside of it. The Israelites put Aaron's budded uh, staff, and it also had the jar of, of manna and the Ten Commandments. And, and on top of this lid, there were two cherub with their wings outstretched coming together to a point. And that section in between this area of the wings was known as the mercy seat. It was the dwelling place of God. And so there at the mercy seat, the priest would sprinkle blood of this goat onto that portion of the mercy seat. And then he would step back and he would sprinkle blood before or in front of the entire ark. And after he did that, and he basically what he's doing by, by presenting this offering, this, this blood sacrifice, he is begging the God of the universe, the, the creator of all, here is our sacrifice, show mercy to us. Which is why it got its name, the mercy seat. It's because only God could grant the absolution of sin, the forgiveness of sin. The removal of sin. And then he, the, the priest would come back outside to where the people were, where the altar was, and he would take this same blood of this goat and he would put it on the 
the horns of the altar, and then he would sprinkle it on the altar seven times so that the people of Israel could see the representation of the sacrifice being made for their behalf. And Jesus is here in this passage of Ephesians chapter 5 being told that he is this offering and this sacrifice to God, which is a fragrant aroma. Beloved in the Old Testament, and we say this every time we take the Lord's Supper, every time when we get to the end, we are reminded of the truth that the Old Testament tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no covering, no removal of sin. And but that all things are cleansed by blood. And blood, that is what Jesus Christ did for us. He didn't just come to this earth as the Savior, as the Christ, announcing that he was going to redeem us. He, he did not just come to this earth to go outside of the city so that he could take on the sins of the world. But he also had to die a literal death. And on Good Friday, he did not swoon. On Good Friday, he did not pretend. On Good Friday, he didn't just faint away. On Good Friday, he gave up his life willingly. He said that no one takes his life, but he gives it freely. And he said on that day, it is finished. And he breathed his last. And when he did, the Son of God, the glorious one, died as the sacrifice for your sin and for mine. His blood paid the payment to be put upon the mercy seat of God. And at that moment, the temple curtain was torn apart so that you and I now have access to him, the Prince of Glory, who will return as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who will come triumphantly, not as the Lamb led to slaughter, but as King, and he will return. And so this brings us then to a concluding kind of thought process. As we understand this process that Jesus indeed took on this role of being Savior and substitute and sacrifice, we see that he did so. But we're still at this issue of do we need him? Do we actually need Jesus to this day? The answer, obviously, for those of us who have a relationship with him, know that the answer is yes, a resounding yes. We need Jesus. But I'd like to close, if you will, with some thoughts from, from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is the one who, who penned the phrase in his, in his phraseology where he says that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Beloved people in his story today and in modern society as we read history books, they tell us that Jesus is a good man. He was a good teacher. Even the, even the people of the Islamic faith say that he was a good prophet. Actually, they go even a little bit further, quite frankly. But they would even say he's a good prophet. But if he is indeed this good man, if indeed he is this good prophet, and this good man and this good prophet actually said the things he said, which he did, then he does say that he's the Savior of the world. He did say to the crowds that he would die, and three days later he would rise again. And after his resurrection, he proved it over the next 40 days as he showed himself to 500 people, including the apostles over 40 days and his life is a proven testimony of his resurrection and if he were just a story if it was just a fable then why did every single one of the apostles die for their faith 
if it was truly a lie, if Jesus really did swoon and he didn't really die on the cross and they pretended it, or if they really did go in and steal his body, which was being reported by the Jews, if that is really what happened, why would they die? Do you really believe that one of them would not have turned at the last minute right before their torture and said, no, it, it was, we weren't serious. We were messing around. We just took him. You're right, he's dead. We stole the body. So either Jesus is who he says he is or he is a liar. But he cannot be both. You cannot look at him and say he declares that he is the Savior he declares that he will die and rise again and not hold to that because if you do, if you say he's a good man but he's a liar, then how is he a good man? How can he truly be trusted as a liar? He can't. And if he cannot be trusted because he's a liar, then he's not good. He's not good. But also, is he a lunatic? In other words, is he just a crazy man? If he really is just a crazy man, then why 2,000 years later are there literally billions of lives over the centuries who have been changed? Why, if you are here this day and you have met him and your life has changed, why are you here? If he's just a lunatic, a crazy man, then why for 2,000 years has he endured? Don't you think if he was just this crazy guy, we would have forgotten his name? It would have gone away in the annals of history? But he's not. He wasn't a liar, and he wasn't crazy. And that is the reason why we still convene to this day. And so if he's not a liar, if he's not crazy, and if he's still affecting lives even now, then that only leaves one conclusion, and that is he's Lord. And if he is indeed Lord, then you have to ask yourself, do you need him? And the answer is yes. You do need him. But then that begs the second question. Will you... Submit to him. Because if he is Lord, then that means he is the one in charge. And anything, when he gives a command, anything that is contradictory to that command means he is not Lord of your life. And you then have to do a heart check and a faith check and a gut check. And you have to be authentic and real before this Lord who requires absolute and utter obedience and devotion to him. He says he will not share his glory with anyone. He will not take second place. There is no race that he is in competition with. He is that far ahead. And you have to ask yourself, what position does he place in your life? Because if he is indeed the only way to heaven, which he is, because that's what the scriptures tell us, he says, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father but by me, if indeed he is who he says, and if his truth claim is no one comes to him except by him, that Muhammad won't get you there, that, that, that Buddha won't get you there, that following the teachings of Confucius won't get you there, if all of these kinds of things are true, then you have to obey him. And he has to be Lord. And he did come to be Savior. He did come to be a substitute. And he did come to be a sacrifice so that you could experience his lordship. What will you do with him? Will you receive this Jesus and receive his peace? Will you receive this Jesus and worship him and truly have your life changed so that you will one day enter in with him? and experience all of eternity in his presence and in his goodness? Or will you reject him? Because if you do, the scriptures are also clear about that, that your consequence is an eternal separation from his love in a place called the lake of fire. 
and you have the choice. Where do you wish to spend eternity? Because it is real. And Jesus is who he says he was. And he is Savior, substitute, sacrifice, and therefore Lord. What will you do with him this morning? Let's pray.